Mark chapter 2 verse 1. Now after some days, when he returned to Capernaum, the news spread that he was at home. So many gathered that there was no longer any room, not even by the door, and he preached the word to them. Some people came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four of them. When they were not able to bring him in because of the crowd, they removed the roof above Jesus. Then, after tearing it out, they lowered the stretcher the paralytic was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the experts in the law were sitting there, turning these things over in their minds. Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now immediately when Jesus realised in his spirit that they were contemplating such thoughts, he said to them, Why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up, take your stretcher and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, stand up, take your stretcher and go home. And immediately the man stood up, took his stretcher and went out in front of them all. They were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This story is another progression in the establishment of Jesus' credentials, and this time that he has the ability to forgive sin. This was a tricky one for Mark, because how does he demonstrate that sins have actually been forgiven? So he implies that the man's infirmity is a result of his sins, in order that forgiveness can be inferred from his healing. An unintended consequence of this attempt to demonstrate forgiveness was to imply that the handicapped and the sick suffer because of their own sins, rather than because they were just unlucky, and hence question whether they deserve help and healing. Another point about this passage is it is our first encounter with a literary device that Mark uses repeatedly, called a Markian sandwich, in which one story is split into two parts and a second story is inserted between them. So in this case we have the story of the paralytic coming through the roof and being healed, and in the middle of it we have the psychic Jesus working out what the others are thinking and ticking them off. In this case the stories are quite clearly linked, but in some other examples the linkage is much less apparent. It seems in general that when Mark uses this device, his intention is that the outer story informs the interpretation of the inner story. The outer story in this case is the paralytic carried by four men and lowered through the roof. He is forgiven and healed, gets up and goes home, and everybody is amazed. The middle story is our experts in the law thinking critically about his claim to forgive sins. Their thoughts are known to Jesus who rebukes them and links visible power to heal with invisible power to forgive. This is a pretty big deal theologically because holy men can do miracles and heal, but forgiveness of sins is the prerogative of only God. And so here again, in Mark, Jesus is God. Verse 13 Jesus went out again by the sea, and the whole crowd came to him, and he taught them. As he went along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. Follow me, he said to him. And he got up and followed him. As Jesus was having a meal in Levi's home, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the experts in the law and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are healthy don't need a physician, but those who are sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So another follower is called, again following him immediately. This time Levi, the son of Alphaeus, a tax collector. The tax booth was a place where sales taxes were paid to the Roman government. So who was Levi and why mention that he was the son of Alphaeus? But the call of Levi is not just a question of demonstrating Jesus' authority, it's also setting up the next scene, which is to show Jesus' affiliation with bad characters. Mark's making a social point here about who is and who is not acceptable as converts. Verse 18 Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. So they came to Jesus and said, Why do the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they do not fast. But the days are coming when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and at that time they will fast. We have a divergence between John's disciples' practices and Jesus's, confirming that John has not ceded authority over his flock to Jesus. 
Then we've got this bridegroom metaphor, implying that while the bridegroom, for that is Jesus, is with them, the fasting regulations are suspended, but will be resumed once he goes, in other words, once he dies. This does imply a transient divine presence on earth, during which some of God's laws are temporarily changed. This is an early and godly characteristic in that suspending God's laws is hardly a human property. Noting that one of the arguments in favour of historicity is that the earlier we look, the more human Jesus becomes, not necessarily so. Then from verse 21 we have a somewhat baffling theme change. No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and the tear becomes worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the skins will be destroyed. Instead, new wine is poured into new wineskins. This is a bit of a divergence from the previous pericope where God's laws are temporarily altered during Jesus' earthly sojourn. This time we have a more permanent incompatibility of old and new. Of course, the Christians claim that this is a reference to the inability to patch up the old covenant and a necessity, therefore, to replace it with a new covenant. Actually, Mark is taking two examples that illustrate cases where mixing new and old makes both of the new and the old worse. But he's not saying whether the old or the new is to be preferred, as the Christians claim. What if by the old he meant a previous mythical Christian faith, and by the new he meant new historicist Christian faith? That would make more sense. You could more clearly see how both systems had their merits, but could not be mixed, because the mixture would undermine the tenets of both. Mythicist Christianity would be undermined by having the god demeaned to become a man, whereas the historicist Christianity would be undermined by the question of whether or not the man had ever existed. Verse 23. Jesus was going through the grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples began to pick some heads of wheat as they made their way. So the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing what is against the law on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need, and he and his companions were hungry? How he entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest, and ate the sacred bread, which is against the law for anyone but the priest to eat, and also gave it to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. For this reason the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark's being a little clumsy here. What Jesus ought to have done is to criticise the Pharisees for imposing man-made elaborations on God's law, because this is delving into the issue of what constitutes work on the Sabbath. He's focusing on a particularly strict interpretation of that. Going out and harvesting a field is clearly work on the Sabbath. Is it work to pluck ears of corn as walking through the field? Well, it's kind of the same thing, and this was part of the debate within Judaism. An even more extreme version than implied here was that you couldn't walk through a field of corn in case you accidentally knocked ears off on the Sabbath. But Jesus doesn't make this point. Instead, he tries to make an argument that under particular circumstances, it's justifiable to break the law, even though the circumstances of his disciples are hardly extreme in this story. And further, David and his men do not break the law in the incident that he cites from 1 Samuel 21. They eat the holy bread, but only after the priest, who was actually Ahimelech, has established that they are pure enough to do so. And then verse 27 goes, The Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. For this reason the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Mark really is all over the place here. His disciples break Sabbath rules. He first justifies this by saying it's okay to break rules under particular circumstances, there being no such circumstances in his disciples' case, and he cites an inappropriate precedent. Now he says, well, the rules don't matter because the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. There is a further interesting view here, and that is that if Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, it follows that man is Lord of the Sabbath, not the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This non sequitur has been used to argue that the original for this saying was Aramaic, because in the Aramaic language, son of man and man are the same word. So Mark chapter 2 does progress the Jesus narrative, with another healing, but perhaps more importantly, with not only the ability to forgive sins, but also authority over Sabbath laws. Although this authority isn't very well developed and is mixed with some rather weak arguments rather than simply authoritarian diktats.